Today, we are sharing stories of perseverance, resilience, and growth from my 2S LGBTQIA community on Spotlight Features, celebrating pride. We honor that we are filming today on the unceded, traditional, and ancestral lands of the Silix Okanagan people. Hey, my name is Almez Wilder, and I'm a trans barber and owner of Ritual Barbershop located here in Vernon, BC. First up is my close buddy, Emmerich Reed. He's a trans therapist located in Kelowna, BC, we recently just celebrated his one year on testosterone and it was a blast. Now, let's dive in. What is it like to be a trans therapist? I remember the first time becoming kind of aware of my gender and someone mistaking me for my father's son and him correcting them that I was his daughter and being confused of like, oh, what, what? I am, I am daughter, what? <laughs> Primarily, I work in trauma therapy and gender affirming supportive care, as well as in neurodivergence. What made me want to become a psychotherapist was becoming the person that I needed back when I was younger. I grew up on a farm in a time and in a community where I didn't know um, what a trans person was. One of the things that really informs my, my work is with regard to that is like my upbringing. I began my medical transition with testosterone in January of 2022. I always say like it felt like I existed up here my whole life. And after top surgery, it's like my awareness of, of being in body went all the way down. I remember waking up from top surgery, just putting my hand on my chest and crying. And then I think I woke up like every day for a month after that, remembering and then just being so free and so happy. There were a lot of things that were really difficult about transition and being a psychotherapist in a small community. With the intense rhetoric around trans people being um, mentally ill or dangerous, that actually ended up showing up in my sessions a lot with clients that I'd had for years were suddenly feeling a nervousness about me. Just these like really um, big influences from media suddenly showing up in such an individual and intimate and what should be safe space. The day that I had my first trans client post-medical transition, post coming out, it felt like being a therapist again for the first time. It felt like my first session all of a sudden. But what was amazing was how I got to hear myself uh, as a therapist speaking the assurance and the comfort and the source of support that was just so needed for me back when I was younger. When I see people in my community that I work with coming out to their family first time or, or not only just like turning towards that voice so that they can hear it themselves, but then that voice amplifying loud enough that now it's in their community, that never gets old. Once we are just given that, uh, that right to exist and, and be real and be human, um, who are we beyond that? That's just something that I really want to see more of in my lifetime is trans people everywhere. <laughs> Next up is a drag performer located in West Kootenays. Being on stage in drag has given them self-discovery and personal expression that has no rules. And we are the Dancing Knights! 
My drag is like a drag king and drag queen together, mixed together. That becomes Shiraz, a non-binary drag performer. I started theater when I was seven, and it's always something I really enjoy doing. The way I met Alex, who's in the Dancing Legs too, he was working on a puppet show with the AFCO, which is the Association des Francophones des Kootenays West, about the French pioneers of the West Kootenays. So we did like a little tour, and then that's how I kind of got back into like performing. <laughs> Alex's partner is Lev, so we kind of all went for a beer and chatted, and we started chatting about drag, and we were like, oh my gosh, this is such a fun art form. It feels so complete, because you build a persona, you do your own makeup, and you create the choreography and all of that, and we're like, oh, that, that would be fun to start doing. We did not even add a, a name for a group. We never did drag makeup, and it was all new. I, Never, never had worn high heels before. And then we did the show and people loved it. And we loved it. And then it kind of snowballed into that. Drag is for anyone and you can kind of play with it as you desire. And in the beginning, I remember my inspiration was kind of Katy Perry, but I, I never went there. Once we started building it, I, I went for something completely different. As the years and the months went by, Shiraz kind of took place. It was not fully feminine, it was not also fully masculine, it was this kind of in-between and playfulness. And I think that once I started doing things more masculine, I felt something else kick in. Also, these are my children, I did not steal them from anyone. <laughs> I'm pansexual and I always knew that, but the gender identity piece kind of came as I was doing drag and I felt that there was something else in me, but I could not name it. Growing up, I didn't have the words and no one around me or in the media was non-binary or gender non-conforming. And more, the more Shiraz was going to a more masculine place brought me confidence. And then I was like, oh my, I think that I have that in me. For me, being non-binary is just being myself and not feeling like a female, not feeling like a man feeling kind of in between and, or sometimes more feminine and something more masculine and it doesn't have to be one way or the other and there's so many people out there that it's so insane that we have to think that there's only two two options when there's so many so many and you can be the person you want to be Marriage is a gift. It was the best day of my life. Sadly, our communities had to fight for these rights. Tess Healy and Wendy Young were pivotal activists for marriage equality. They were one of eight same-sex couples to legally marry in the early 2000s. We did not go looking for this fight. But when it landed on our doorstep, all of a sudden, it made sense. On October 2nd, 2001, the British Columbia Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriage was not allowed under the Canadian Constitution. Eight same-sex couples were selected to stand up and oppose that ruling. This story is about one of those couples. Our thoughts on marriage were not something that were a big deal until we were told you could not get married legally. As a feminist and a heterosexual, I could choose not to get married. But as a same-sex couple, that choice was already made for me. I was a second-class citizen, not considered enough a part of the society to be able to enter into this contract. 
We received a phone call one evening. It was the night before our commitment ceremony and people were waiting for us out on the deck for the rehearsal and we're answering questions about becoming part of a lawsuit. This was EGAL, the National Equality for Gays and Lesbians Everywhere, and they wanted couples in solid relationships who could stand media scrutiny. And we had to go down to the Marriage Licence Bureau, ask for a marriage licence and be refused. And that refusal was the basis of the case. I felt that we had to do this. We needed to stand up. The support that we received locally, what stands out first and foremost was the media. The media wanted to make sure that there was balance. And so our story and us as a couple, we became um, the face of same-sex marriage in Prince George. Our argument was very simply, this is not about religion. This was about civil rights. And it going to the Supreme Court of Canada and the federal government deciding not to continue the case, the opponents actually tried to apply so that they could continue the case in lieu of the government and the government and the Supreme Court wouldn't let them, that this is the process and we won. Once the court case was won, we were invited to be the marshals for the Pride Parade that year. Mm -hmm. And then we had our legal ceremony in front of everyone that wanted to stay um, at the park. I don't think either of us expected or understood just what the same-sex marriage case would mean to other people. I had a mother come up to me and thank me for doing this because her daughter had been having suicidal thoughts because she thought she was different. She thought she was alone. Because we were on the front page of the paper, went to talk to her mother. And this is her mother talking to us and saying, we're in counseling now, she's doing well, you saved my child's life. The advice that I would give to a young person that's scared or feeling alone or not sure is to find somebody they trust and talk to them. One person. Trans folks are both being celebrated and are at risk of violence. We're four more times likely to experience violence than cis folks. Jamie Schmetterling transitioned 13 years ago and almost lost her life for being herself. The biggest worst thing about transition is that some people do get violent. Hate crimes against our transgender community have skyrocketed. Three transgender women were attacked in fear about deadly attacks. I was taken down in a hate crime. I never struggled with my identity. I never did. I grew up conditioned. I did men things because that's what men did. I never thought about being transgender until the day. It was just a realization. Just like that, like a gobsmack. Ah, I get it. I'm a woman. It was a shock to me almost, but it was just like, I get it. I'll never forget that day. I did lose some lifelong friends. I had people say to me that they just couldn't deal with it. Also, family didn't take it well. I said, like, Mom, if you can't say you love me, then you can't be my mom. And uh, I haven't talked to my mom since. There was difficulty being the first openly transgender person in town. Some people yelled at me. I just did not let it bother me. I was never afraid of anybody trying to hurt me in Squamish. Four years ago, I was approaching the store, and 
This person starts screaming at me how I'm disgusting and disgraced to God. And next time I know this person spins around, just clocks me, just clocks me. I remember putting my hands up and they clocked me again. And that's all I remember until I woke up in the hospital. I couldn't walk a straight line. I couldn't think, I couldn't remember. I'm left with permanent brain damage. It cost me years wages and it really set me back. It's hard, it's hard. I never thought, I never thought that I would get almost beat to death um, just for being who I am. I've never walked in fear. I won't allow myself to walk in fear. This, this is my town, this is my home. I'm not gonna let anybody drive me away. I've never thought about detransitioning. It's never been a question. I think if anything, it's a reason to stay. I think to go back to living male would be less true to myself and probably worse. I can't even think of it. <laughs> I'm very happy to be who I am. I've, I've never been a better person and more at peace with myself than I have been for the last 13 years. I was gonna be Jamie. <laughs>
It felt like I defied everybody and I was okay. Me and my dad are very close now, so that's the good side of the story. But it took many, many years, over a decade, for us to actually be able to be in a room together. We went last April to Mexico for a week, and my dad was sitting there in, a, in, my, in my condo in Puerto Vallarta. And he said, son, I want to tell you something. And he says, being with you for a week, you're really kind. Leave it. Everything's possible. Never, ever listen to somebody that is going to go against who you really are. Be yourself. If you could go back, how could you help the people that helped you? Dean Tholner from Nanaimo, BC is the king of inclusion and acceptance. His mission and story is to end the stigma and educate about mental health and addiction. Well, every day I wake up and I'm grateful. When you have a near-death experience and you have this second chance at life and when you go from you know, despair to hope, I believe you, it's almost like a gift. I was diagnosed HIV positive um, in my late 20s and very quickly succumbed to AIDS and was on life support, was given a couple days to live. I was very lucky at that time that the CDC had invented a cocktail that would now ensure that every person with HIV could live their life expectancy. I remember being really sick and thinking I was going to die and watching my friends march down Davie Street in Vancouver with these signs that said, act up now. And they were demanding that there was resources, there was demanding education and, and social justice. And it was the smaller organizations and the niche sort of groups that were trying to band together to get these medications and to get the governments to start realizing that something needed to be done. And I saw the power in it, and I saw the power in community, and I thought, this is amazing, and I think we should create an event to thank the very hospital and to thank all those people. You know, we lost hundreds of thousands of gay men. Um, they were our friends, they were our fathers, our brothers, our neighbors. And it was important to recognize that, and it was important to recognize the people that stood up and, and got us to where we are today. So I started this project called Shine. Shine is a fundraiser for mental health and we reach out to primarily the artistic community and the LGBTQ community. A lot of people that are in those communities have had a difficult journey to be able to be their authentic selves. And it is an easy ask to ask a creative person or an artistic person to give back on their own terms. It's been so heartwarming to see the hundreds of thousands of people both on stage, behind stage, the volunteers and the community that comes to Unite to make a heartfelt difference. But you can go back Most of the people that are on the Shine team come from lived experience. So they're already sensitive or compassionate to this cause. I'm really emotional actually, and I'm emotional because I, I'm in awe of the tremendous amount of community members that have come out to support our local charities. Every cent that we make in that production, we give all back to community. And we've been able to help these individual programs or these societies or organizations grow and be able to feel more financially secure. Sometimes I look back and I look at the person that I was before I got sick and the person that I am now, and I'm not so sure I'm fond of the person that I was before, but I really like who I am now. And it taught me to move away from myself and to see greater and to see the connectivity of community. I'm really grateful to have this compassionate, loving husband, David Veljasic. Um, I'm very happy with the life that we have. Um, and I'm really, really um, excited to see what the future holds for Shine. And I'm really grateful that the community members continue to unite and in the spirit of giving back. All of our rainbow guests have shown a great deal of strength. Our next feature is a bisexual country singer in Saskatchewan. 
L.J. Tyson shares his beacon of light living in a small town. Through the stormy weather, I have wrapped myself in you. But on these icy highways, I am spinning out of truth. Country music is sewn into the fabric of this place. You know, I, I love country music and I always will, but I wish it was a kinder, more open place. I identify as a two-spirit person. I also identify as a gay man, that's all so important for me to say just up front because it's my identity. And for so long I feel like lots of people in minority groups have had to kind of minimize their identity. Conservative small place in the middle of Saskatchewan Little boys got more to hide than anyone well, I wrote that song in about 15 minutes and I felt such th sympathy for 14 year old me having all these confusing feelings and not really knowing what was right and what was wrong and I just wanted to give that person a hug. So my way of doing that was by writing the song of being like, you know, you have to know, you have to know. But there's a home on a rainbow. I came to do what I wanted to do, what I originally set out to do and um, that's write a really good queer themed country song <laughs> that was unapologetically gay. Let's say that. Sounds fun until it's done. The kind of things I write about made a lot of audiences uncomfortable. When this indigenous kid who happens to be queer is starting to write songs about falling in love with a guy, the audiences just didn't want to hear it at the time. And a lot of the other country artists didn't want to share a bill with me. It just became very, very hard to work. And sure enough, you know, we found our audiences and we found some safe spaces, but it was such a battle. Me and my family didn't talk about it a whole lot. I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. When I eventually did come out to them, it was mostly uh, just love and acceptance. Some fear because they, uh, they know stories about how people are treated around around these parts, I guess I could say. Prince Albert is absolutely beautiful. It is a unique place. I'm so used to it because I grew up here. Um, I wrote a line once upon a time saying that the city streets are like the back of my hands. It's home. I don't know what, what else to say other than it's home, um, but people can have complicated relationships with their homes. I stick around PA. I still like it. I want to make things uh, better for uh, people like myself uh, living here, being a part of uh, the Indigenous community and the queer community. Oh, I'm still Thanks for spending time with us today, and we hope you get inspired by these incredible people and stories. To learn more about celebrating pride, head to shawspotlight.ca and follow us on social media. The day that I had my first trans client, post-medical transition, post-coming out, it felt like being a therapist again for the first time. It felt like my first session all of a sudden. <laughs> We did not go looking for this fight, but when it landed on our doorstep, all of a sudden, it made sense. I've never walked in fear, and I won't allow myself to walk in fear. This, this is my town, this is my home. Never, ever listen to somebody that is going to go against who you really are. Be yourself. I'm not sure that I would like the person I was before, but I'm certainly grateful to be the person I am today. And it taught me to see the connectivity of community. When this indigenous kid is starting to write songs about falling in love with a guy, the audiences just didn't want to hear it at the time.